Hello, Hello everybody. This is Peter. Welcome to the January 13th Zeitgeist Movement radio broadcast. I'm coming live from the Venus Project, sitting here with Jacques and Roxanne. Say hello, Jacques. Hi. How are you? Very good. <laughs> and Roxanne? Hi. And it's a real pleasure to be here, and I think uh, it should be a, lot, a fun show and to have a more direct interaction and kind of have a conversation with the three of us. And, of course, answer your questions and the things that we always do on the radio show. Hello, Jacques. I was wondering if any well-known scientists were in support of the Venus Project, and do you feel it's relevant for other professionals to condone this direction? No, uh, I don't think I welcome the idea of people joining because a well-known scientist okay. approves of it. Uh, well-known scientists in the past used to write books on why man can't fly. And uh, an American rocket expert named Goddard said that it wouldn't be proper to talk about rocketry at any scientific community meetings because then you're looked upon as somewhat of a crackpot. So he said he had to refrain from talking about those things in scientific circles. Of course, I would say that they were not scientific. Of the people that know little about rocketry or anything else should say, I don't know enough about it. You think man will ever get to the moon? I don't know. Not say not in a thousand years. You're not an expert at it. So the most difficult thing to learn to say is I don't know. Yes, very good. There's also a comment that you mentioned that people tend to feel that there's an authority issue where they say, well, I'm not going to use my own mind to trust this information. I'm going to wait for some authority to tell me it's okay, specifically scientists. Well, if you do that, you're stuck with pretty old values. New systems like... Uh, when Edison, if he did invent the electric lamp, like they say he did, he had to explain to the gas company and to other people how it differed from conventional lamps. It's not a natural thing for people to sit back and say, I think I understand the Venus Project. Edison had to describe that. The Wright brothers had to describe to other people how the flying machine worked, how they banged and turned, and how it was propelled by a propeller or an air screw. The average person didn't know about that. That's why it took an explanation. Uh, if people just read or glance over what a Venus project is, it is not possible for people to immediately interpret what a Venus project is without comprehensive knowledge about many different aspects of it. And when someone puts the question, what about human behavior aspect? What will the schools be like? Well, just, just say if you're a member of the Zeitgeist Movement, so I've never gone into that. I don't have detail on that. I may be able to answer some questions on city planning. Uh, but the Venus Project of itself is very, very well detailed in how to educate children so you don't have many of the problems you have today. Yes. Will you anything like to add to that? Before I... Well, I think you both stated, too, that it, it would be kind of sad that you need an authority figure to tell you whether this direction is appropriate. We invite you to look into it and, and learn about it. And um, if you do need that approval, then, then you probably won't go along with it too well because you'll get different opinions about this from as many different people as you talk to, even in the academic field. And I'd also add, as, as Jacques pointed out, that the value systems, uh, even for the most advanced scientists, are often stuck in old values. Yes. You had commented that even Albert Einstein was a very traditional man. Yes. And he had a very traditional in values. In many areas. In many areas. And, and also, it's also important to point out that when new things come along, they're always going to be remote. They're always going to have people that, that are basically afraid to identify with it because it's so radical from their traditional well, values. Even the sweatshops that used to have children working Saturday and Sunday, and they had to fight to get new laws passed so that children could not be used in factories. And the same thing for women's rights or Afro-American rights or Jewish rights or Polish rights. Every inch of the way there was a battle and rejection. Mm -hmm. So if the majority of people reject something, it doesn't mean that it's not worth considering. It means that you've got a lot of work to do to turn people around. You have to present 
new and additional information for them to think about, and you have to help them through it and provide them with the answers, not just say, let's build a Venus project. They have to understand the anatomy of it and why it's designed the way it is. And this is so contrary to the way that the establishment thinks that the approval probably will not come from the establishment or the academic world unless they really are searching and honest and looking into new ideas, understanding that this system is not working for people. Yes, yes. And as one final note on this, I've been in the process of investigating different personalities to get involved with my film or to get involved with uh, the event in New York. And a, a common reaction that I've come to find is that while certain people are in line with certain aspects of what we describe, their ego relationship and their profit and monetary relationship, meaning the books that they sell, the establishment that they've created, stops them from, from basically from moving forward into something that might encompass or might even override themselves, reducing their, their identity because they, they become a part of something as opposed to being separate in their own ideological establishment. And this is another unfortunate reality we deal with, um, with on this topic. I agree with that. Very good. Okay, well I think we can leave that one alone. Jacques and Roxanne, this is question number two. I know you've addressed this before, but I've been interacting with many people that have a great appreciation for the Venus Project. However, they're still very much involved in metaphysics, pseudoscience, faith healing, crystal energy healing, and psychic abilities, and many other things that they feel is a part of the movement or the Venus Project. Would you mind expressing your disposition on these metaphysical issues for those that think you advocate such things? Well, I don't advocate any form of magic or any religion or any practices that uh, cannot be tested and get the same results over and over again. Science in general does not use terms like, believe me, this is the strongest metal available. They say things like this, its torsional strength is so much, its compression strength is so much, its tension strength is so much. They present mathematical evidence, and also, even when they design a beam or a structural member made of concrete or steel, they still put it in the machine and compress it until it splits, and they say, our mathematics is correct. I like that system because it's not subject to human limitations. When you put things to test, and most metaphysicians don't know how to do that, they really don't know how to test the system. Uh, their statistical data is incorrect when they say that this person has a higher probability. It can guess more things than the normal, than the norm, then they don't know what the norm is. In other words, they assume that they should guess 50% right and 50% wrong. Man has achieved what they've achieved, or humanity has achieved that, because they had evolved better methods. If I put a number of coins in your pocket and you jiggle your pocket, if you can't see the coins, you know that there's over 10 or under 3 by associative memory, by experience. So man is able to go a little beyond the statistical average. So whenever you set a statistical average and you know that man is going beyond what it should be, it means your numbers are wrong. Good point, good point. Would you like to add anything to that, sir? Well, again, just saying that the, the scientist has a lab and the metaphysician does not. They don't go in and check things. Science is mainly a closer approximation of our environment and what's out there. They don't guess at things or hope and wish and have aspirations and feel that that might be true. You couldn't build bridges that way or build buildings. So it's a very different system. Yes. Yeah. I would just simply add that there's a unique combination, well, excuse me, there's a unique association with what we always consider orthodox metaphysics, meaning religion as we know it, superstition, people yes. dying and being resurrected. Yes, yeah. yeah, so then there's a, what people often refer to as sort of a new age metaphysics. Yes. 
and I think they're equally as, as dangerous, for lack of a better expression. Mm-hmm. And I, I know that there's many people out there that have contacted me, and they say, oh, I loved your film about what you said about religion, and I completely agree, but then they go off on all these other tangents about things that are really unprovable, that have mm-hmm. no basis. And again, we don't dismiss things outright. If people can prove uh, that something can be done, that telekinesis can be shown, well, then let's see it. It's subject to examination. It is. Every, every time I examine anything like that, such as moving objects without touching them, called telekinesis, uh, I found that magnets were used or other devices. So far, most people are not qualified observers. And so when they go to check things out, I remember a meeting of the American Psychological Association. They were going to check out mental telepathy. I said, how would you check that out? And they said, well, we'd we'd go there and see if a person could actually read the mind of another person. I said, how would you go about that? Well, they didn't have any specific method. So I suggested different methods. And they said, well, why don't you do that? That was not the point of my discussion. My point of discussion was, are you qualified to check out metaphysical demonstrations? That's the question. So, in other words, whenever I saw a person do something or act upon something, such as telepathic methods, where I noticed two people that were telepathic, they said they were, So this particular individual had his wife go into my bedroom and I whispered in his ear, Thomas Jefferson, from my own collection. And his wife came out and she said, you whispered in my husband's ear, Thomas Jefferson. Well, that seemed very good. Here's how it works. He has a code established with his wife. If he's sitting with his arms folded, it means Thomas Jefferson. If he clasps his hands together, that means President Kennedy. So there are many different ways of communicating information. So far, I found no evidence of mental telepathy. Now, there is such a thing as parallel values. If people grew up together and they learn to understand each other quite well and they read similar books, they can walk down the street, observe some phenomena, look at each other and smile and they feel they have a mental connection with the other person. Actually, it's not that. It's parallel values. Yeah. I um, have identi- I have cousins which are identical twins, and when I grew up with them, because they were always together, they were very, very tight, very close. Even to this day, they very much are. They were raised, of course, very, very close, and they had a tendency to almost complete each other's sentences. They were so familiar with each other. It was quite spooky at times, almost like there was something magical about it, but it really isn't. Well, that's the same thing if you were brought up in Italy with an Italian family. You might speak with a certain dialect if you came to this country, and they all speak in the same dialect. And they say, well, how is it possible that different people in different countries come up with the same invention at about the same time? Because conditions at the same time produce those needs. In other words... If we live in an economic downturn of society, people begin to ask questions. What makes an economic downturn? Why do they all ask that question at the same time? Because they're all affected by the same conditions. That's why people all over the world seem to invent radios, telephones at the same time, because the threats and the needs are the same at the same time. Right. And that type of... um that type of metaphysical association was really oh. well established by your friend Ken Kyes, who did yes. the hundredth monkey, yes. which is the idea that once the hundredth monkey did something and all hundred were doing it, then thousands instantly did it through some yeah. form of yeah. pseudo telepathic. Well, that, that's projection of their own value system rather than putting anything to test. When they checked out the claims that monkeys do that, they found there was no basis, none whatsoever, yeah. to prove that. And just to add one final note to this, I, I, there's a tendency out there I've seen that's very large where people want to believe there's a higher level of human interaction, some type of plane of, of, of interaction that exists that is not physical, if you will, and that it, somehow it's triggered. And I, it's such a strange notion. It's a poetic notion. It's going to yeah, unify yeah. people. But it's very romantic. I can yeah, see the yeah. beauty of it in that regard. But it's very common these days. I'm sure you've run into that with people right. that have visited you. Well... 
uh, sometimes nations spy upon other nations, and if they're building war tanks, and you put that theory to test, you find it better than the cavalry. However, in Poland, during World War II, they believed in the cavalry. They felt that you needed horses to climb unusual terrain. But the Germans used war tanks, and they slaughtered the, the Polish cavalry. If a nation can't adjust to times and come up with appropriate decisions, they will be surpassed. If our nation fails to make appropriate decisions for the future, we will become a second and third-rate nation. Yes. And when it comes to nations, it really doesn't even matter in that regard. It's more of a gesture that you describe. This nation isn't even important. It's really the world that's important. Of course. But unfortunately, uh, you know, people... Yeah, you're, the, what you state, though, is absolutely well, good. If, if we cling to ideas tenaciously because our grandfather believed that or our parents believed that, rather than checking it out, in other words, the Bible says, honor thy father and mother. Well, if we did that, we'd still be living in caves. <laughs> when do you begin to broaden? When do you begin to change? If you follow your father and mother because they were decent people and meant well, they could be wrong in many areas. All I'm telling you is to honor any human being worthy of honor. Yes, yes, very good. Okay, let's move on to the next question. Question three. What techniques would you use to deal with problems that are non-monetary, crimes, so to speak, that are non-monetary, such as rapists and incest? And jealousy. We've covered this a little bit before. Yes. Techniques would be educational, correct? Yes. Uh, technique would be so arranging the environment as to eliminate those patterns of behavior. When I say eliminate, I mean they are well enough informed not to behave in any way that would irritate or hurt other people. Now, that's hard to conceive. If you had lived near a very large lake, say as large as Lake Superior, and, and the water were very clean, no one would steal water. No one steals when there's easy access to things. In other words, if you go out to your house and you breathe fresh air, there's so much of it, no one could set a price tag on it. But water used to be free because it was abundant. Now that it's scarcer, you have to pay a buck for a glass of water. So scarcity determines a lot of the laws enacted and our behavior regarding resources. If, if people have access to the necessities of life without filling out forms, occasioning to certain people, becoming subservient to certain people, if it's available freely, they don't steal. I've never seen a person steal water from a waterfall when there's an abundance. So. All human behavior is shaped by culture, by environment. If you live in the deep south, you're going to speak with a southern accent. If you live in an uneducated region, you might, you might want to treat the Afro-American a certain way. You might want to beat up a black man, because that would not be your fault. You're brought up in a culture with limited values. But if you've traveled out of that area and have seen and met with people that were Afro-Americans that were mathematical geniuses or inventive, your attitude about Afro-Americans would be different. But if you're brought up in clan country with poorly informed people, you will pick up that value system, just as the Romans did when they used to feed Christians to lions. They felt that Christians were on the wrong track. There's a lot of different gods, the god of war, the god of love, the god of fertilization. They had so many different gods. When you came up with one god, it's easier to get rid of you. So they used to kill people. Even in Salem, Massachusetts, in America, when somebody began to question some aspects of the Bible, they were burned. Now, the people that found these so-called people, they called them witches. And if you found them, you were given their property. Did you know that? Their bank accounts <laughs> and their land. Yeah. That gives them a reason for finding as many witches as they can. That should be in your school books. Right. None of that is. How many of you knew that Douglas MacArthur, when he was a captain, had the army throw tear gas at soldiers who marched for the bonus the government promised them? After World War I, thousands of veterans assembled and were sleeping around the capital. And the army asked them to move because 
It didn't look good to have all these soldiers dressed in uniforms with their medals, coming with crutches, asking for their bonuses that the government promised them. Since the government couldn't deliver, Douglas MacArthur had the army throw tear gas at them. So how can you love your country? How, if you, this is not in your school books, that's called manage education or manage news. And any country that's really free does not have that, and there's no country that doesn't manage its information. I'm trying to tell you that all nations are basically corrupt. As long as there's money used and nationalism and patriotism, which Einstein calls a disease. Yeah, yeah. And children wouldn't, wouldn't even dream of hurting one another if they learn a different type of value system from a very early age. They learn that people aren't their possessions. And in the future, when people would become more extensional to one another, they'd have more to contribute to help one another's lives. And so there'd be a lot of people that you can get along with. So you don't give moral lectures to kids, tell them to be cooperative, but you build it into the environment so they get a different type of understanding so they don't have to uphold laws in order to behave a certain way. So they have a deep understanding of cooperation. For instance, if kids wanted to build a little automobile, it takes several people to help them do that. It would take four or five people to lift the car up where, where a couple other people would have to put the tires on. So people would, children would help one another and uh, cooperation would be understood. They'd, be, they'd have a deeper understanding that they wouldn't want to hurt people because they're extensional, as I mentioned, and helpful. Yes. <clears throat> and the values, of course, are taught such as ego, you want to defend your honor. So when a, a man goes into a room and he finds his wife with somebody else, his reaction it can often be violent, especially in this culture, yes. when in that reality what, a, what, a, what a, someone who's actually educated on how to respond to such situations would say, well, I guess this relationship wasn't what I thought it was, and he'd just walk right out of the room and collect his things. Or well, I might say, apparently I'm not meeting my wife's needs. Very good, right. Uh, but, but violence is an expression which is used when you don't have other ways of thinking about it. Right. So the future will, will bring up children in an environment that exposes them and affords them more tools to think with. When you don't have appropriate tools for thinking about how nature itself works, man invents his own story of somebody up in the clouds that makes a man and woman and turns them loose in a beautiful garden. All these fairy tales that people are given, instead of saying, I don't know how life began, I don't know where the world came from, that's being honest. In the Bible it says, thou shalt not bear false witness. That means say, I don't know, when you really don't know. In the Bible it says, there will always be wars and rumors of war. Rumors of war. We shall always have the poor amongst us. I can't accept that. I know that there are more people fed today in, in, through the technological abundance and scientific agriculture that these problems can be solved. There's nothing that I say, well, look, knock wood. Where do you get all that from, knock wood, or wearing a rabbit's foot, or believing in metaphysics? Because you really don't know, so you have to learn how to say, I don't know. And if you're really concerned about problems, you try to trace it by checking things out. See if it corresponds to the reality, your views. If they're connected to reality, then you can say they're verifiable. But if you don't know, learn to say that. I don't know. Yeah. I know uh, B.F. Skinner had a segment uh, in his book where he talks, in one of his books, where he talks about metamagic thinking. And he references his pigeons, where he gave certain rewards randomly yeah. for certain behaviors of the pigeons. And what he found is that the pigeon would keep doing the same behavior if the reward was random. And I think when it comes to, to metaphysics, what, that's what they do. They, they're constantly doing a behavior, and they think, well, it's not working right now, it's not working right now. And then suddenly it works once, randomly, and they find this egotistical reinforcement. That's a whole theory of gambling. There you go, gambling. That's gambling exactly right. Gambling the same way. It's a it gives you an award occasionally. Mm -hmm. Yes. So Obviously, if the house, the house it. always wins. Yeah. If you don't understand that, oh, yeah. they couldn't be in business. Yeah. Right. 
And a lot of times the metaphysicians think that that's warm and more caring what they're doing. But really, being able to provide more food through science or bridges or better standard of living and housing, that's much more warm than wishing and hoping and aspirations and kind words to one another. Metaphysics really haven't proven themselves in, ter in terms of providing a higher standard of living and a better living situation. Yeah, that was a great example you used earlier, Jacques, earlier uh, yesterday, in fact, where you mentioned a car accident. And so there's a car accident, somebody sees the car accident, they go and they help the person, and they, you know, they pull them out, they save their life. And then when no one's looking, the engineer comes along and he readjusts the road to make sure that accident can never happen again. So who is really more, uh, for lack of a better expression, um, contributing. contributing? Who's contributing more? The, yeah. the engineer, the, the person that gets the glory of saving the person's life. Obviously, the real honor and award, if you wanted to use that, base uh, distinction would go towards the engineer. He's actually solving the problem. Most people don't even know I uh, think of those people. In your park, you have statues of warriors on horses. There's no statue of Madame Curie, Louis Pasteur, very few compared to the warriors. So we're honoring the wrong people. Problem solvers mm -hmm. are the people of the future. If you took soldiers instead of made killing machines of them, send them back to school, free of charge, they don't have to pay for it, to learn to become problem solvers. What a wonderful world we would have instead of killing machines. Yes. I think that story, just expanding on it a little bit here, that you were mentioning is that if there's a roadway on the side of a, of a steep hill and the car goes over and the person's hurt and the first person that gets to them is um, a caregiver and they hold their hand and say, there, there, everything will be all right. Mm. And... Um, the, the person who's hurt remembers that person as being the warm, caring person, but then you take this person to the hospital and the doctors patch them up. And they, they seem to be the, the patchers of the society. Uh -huh. But then an engineer comes along, he changes the roadway, he puts a railing up, he, he tilts the road so it tilts more towards the mountainside, and there's no more accidents. Well, to me, it's the engineer who's warm and caring because there's no one else hurt on that roadway. Yes, that's a great way to expand that example. Uh, and no one seems to think that way. I mean, uh, while I see appreciation for the contributions of humanists, Mother Teresa, people that have given their lives mm -hmm. in poverty, it's really, it's, you can't begin to compare these individuals as well-meaning as they are. Right. To be well-meaning is good, but to actually do something is, Solve the problem. is very different. It causes it in the first place. Okay, to shift gears a little bit, Jacques, um, someone wanted you to elaborate. He was confused about, on a prior radio show, you commented on purpose and the Isn't illusion purpose? of purpose. And he wanted you to elaborate on your perspective of this term, purpose, as we know. Okay. They say that in your school books that plants grow. They cannot grow unless there's radiant energy, ultraviolet light, certain gravity, air pressure, nutritious soil, many different conditions. The plant of itself cannot grow. Neither can human beings unless they're subject to education, to knowledge, to experiment, and to try to find answers. But of yourself, you cannot grow. You need schools, books, experience of other people to accumulate that knowledge would be growth. Nothing in nature is self-operating. Plants depend on radiant energy. A seed, when you put a seed in the ground, if there's snow on the ground, it doesn't grow. So a seed depends on temperature, nutrients, moisture, radiant energy, nothing of itself, no product that we know of is self-operating. Automobiles require fuel. The human body requires few food intake. The brain requires experience, all kinds of different experiences. We of ourselves can do nothing if you raise a human being in a gray ball and just feed it, even though the human being has nothing wrong with it physically, it'll become a cerebral insufficient unless it sees color change, sound changes, and experiences environmental contact. Really, they talk about purpose a lot, and purpose comes from religion. There really is no purpose other than what you 
you make of your life. You can have a hammer and you can hit somebody over the head or you could build a house with it. It depends on what you do. The purpose of that hammer is not to kill somebody, but it could be anything you want it to be. They give purpose to everything. They say that the purpose of your eyebrows is to keep the sweat out of your eyes. But if you start looking for purpose, then you have to say, well, what's the purpose of coughing and sneezing to infect other people around you? They only look at the good things when they talk about purpose. They say the purpose of horns on animals is to defend themselves. Or where's the horns on a rabbit? It sure could use it. In other words, they're always looking for purpose. They think that the purpose of a wet foot on a duck is to get out of the water faster. No, they're born with wet foot, and that gets them out of the water faster. And the only kind of ducks they can reproduce with are web-footed ducks. The others have been caught, didn't get out of the water fast enough. They say the purpose of a long beak on a bird is to get at the worms deep in the soil. Well, when there's a long drought, the only birds that survive are the long beaks. And the only birds they can mate with are long beaks. So you see, if there's lots of floods and lots of water, then flying with a long beak is carrying an extra load. So it's not purposeful for that condition. So there's really, a person said to me, well, the purpose of the eyes are to see with. So I bring them in a dark room and say, see, you need light, you don't see, you need light to reflect images on your retina. And the retina delivers that to the occipital lobe of the brain. And you see with your brain, not with your eyes. In other words, there's such a thing as educated vision, whereas a, an engineer or a machinist sometimes can look at a part and tell me it seems to be a thousandth of an inch off. I didn't know that humans can do that. Most humans do not have that kind of educated vision. True, true. That's a good point. And also a purpose, as you pointed out on a prior radio show, there's an idea of evolutionary purpose and unfolding and adaption. And the issue of purpose, well, it's not even a, the word of purpose isn't as much applicable, but animals stay that fit into their environment. Exactly that. As opposed to grooming somehow through some form of process. They're, right. they're being groomed into it as far as well, They think that nature produces some bugs that look like leaves, and they say that that nature accommodates that bug so it won't be picked off. Now why does nature make one animal hungry and then camouflage the other one so it can't see it? <laughs> I would say that bugs that look like a leaf, when they crawl over a leaf, they're less bothered. So they stay there. And you think that the bug adjusted itself to look like a leaf. That's not true. Because I've painted fish with different types of oil paints and painted the bottom of the tank with different colors. When you paint the fish black and it's over a white area, it's chased by predators until it stays over the black area, and they think that the fish turn black to protect itself. No, each animal stays in regions where they're not detected. Yeah. They're born different ways. If the pattern of their bodies supports survival, they live. If it doesn't, they are picked off. Let me extend that into uh, the word harmony. This is something we also talked about. This idea that there is harmony in nature. Yeah. The romanticism. Well, of it's a metaphysical notion. Mm. What's the purpose then of a Dasami? To kill people? What's the purpose of an earthquake? Why don't you find purpose in everything? What's the purpose of a tornado? To blow people away in villages? When a tornado approaches a church, it doesn't go over that church. It goes right through it. Sure. So there seems to be no purpose in nature. It seems that every fish is eating every other fish. If you want to say there's harmony in nature, what do you mean by harmony? Anything that happens? Right. Right. So I say that if there's harmony in nature, animals wouldn't be tearing other animals apart for food. They'd be converting the sun's radiant energy into flesh instead of killing other animals. In other words, man projects his own simple values continuously in our school books. They give you the purpose of this and the purpose of that, and they don't show you the counter things. In other words, nature's wonderful. I love nature. Well, rat up snakes are part of nature. Constrictors crush animals. That's part of nature. Floods are part of nature. 
Why don't you look at the whole picture and say nature is both constructive and destructive? Yeah. And that would be the honest statement. If there was purpose, then there'd be something up there manipulating it for a certain reason. And um, if, even if you looked at people in that regard, what's the purpose of people to create disaster and suffering and torture and for greedy reasons? you know, and environmental deprivation hmm. and destroying the environment. You have to put it on everything if you're looking for purpose. Yeah. Lots of words and language that really have no, yeah. no operand whatsoever. Our language developed hundreds of years ago. That makes it impossible to talk to people. So we talk at people. Yeah. A lot of people don't know what that means. It means when a person says to you, have a nice weekend, why don't they say, have a nice life? Why just a nice weekend? That's what I mean. We don't know what we're talking about. Right. We talk, you say communication is impossible, essentially, based on the definition of communication, correct? Unless you define what you mean by right. communication. Mm -hmm. sure. We don't study semantics in school, which should be a common subject in the future throughout the world. We have to update our language so it fits the re world of reality, not the projected world of artificiality. Our world today does use some aspects of science and technology. But the school today, our universities, are better equipped than they've ever been, and the wars are getting worse. Is man really civilized? I say not yet. We are not civilized yet, and we never will be, because being civilized is an ongoing process. We learn new things every year, nor is there such a thing as intelligent people. We are have a certain range of knowledge at a certain time. The more you study the subject, the wider the range. But the word intelligence would have little or no meaning in the future because I pointed out many times an intelligent chemist of 75 years ago couldn't get a job today. So what do you mean by intelligent? And one more thing to toss in there while we utilize these words, harmony and, um, and purpose. You made a point um, regarding Homeostasis, I believe, is the word. Yes. And this is a, a denotion of balance. Walter V. Cannon presented the concept of homeostasis, that the body seeks equilibrium. Every phase that the body is in is in equilibrium. There's no such thing as seeking equilibrium. The body reacts to high temperatures. You begin to sweat. If it gets cold, you burn more fat. So it isn't homeostasis that the body seeks. The body reacts to external conditions. Of course, we're not educated to that in our schools. We're educated to values that have been long obsolete and never proven to work. Yes. That's true, that idea of homeostasis in society, too. As long as you have few nations controlling most of the Earth's resources, then you're going to have laws to protect those nations to maintain those resources. So it works in, through the environment as well. Absolutely. There's always a push and pull and it's interesting how people tend to find, they, they, there's a classical assumption to want to find some balance, some, you know, yeah. final balance, if you will. Yeah. But mm -hmm. we, utopian thinking. Yeah, so that's, that's a good word, too, to bring up. It can't out. be utopia, because nothing can be designed that's final. Yeah. No one can design a laptop and say, that's it. It always will change and grow. You can't design the ideal society and say, this is it. It will always grow and change. And that's a history of civilization, growth and change. Okay. So what we're interested in is really making the best with what we have today, but never saying, this is it. Yes, absolutely. Uh, this continues on with these more kind of gestural questions, and something actually we were talking about earlier with the extensionality. The question is, Jacques and Roxanne, what relevance do you think the meaning of the word love has in the Venus Project, I think it would be positive that all understand the basis of this word and consider it a fundamental common interest in the Venus Project. Define I don't know what that means, but I can try to redefine it. Love in the future will be based on, and we, we don't use the word, we use extensionality. When you meet a person that enhances your thinking, elevates your life, offers you information to be uh, better at communication or better at something, they're extensional to you. And you will tend to associate with people that are extensional to you. The fallacy of love is the, the fact that 
everything you've ever done in your life you don't approve of. There's some things you don't like. So sometimes you love yourself, sometimes you dislike yourself, sometimes you even hate yourself or you hate what you've done. So love is a fluctuating situation. Sometimes you love, sometimes you don't, sometimes you do. So when you marry someone, there'll be times when you dislike the person you marry. Say, how do I ever get into this? Then when they bring you a gift, you say, I guess I really love John. And so love is a fluctuating thing, not a fixed thing. Right, yeah. That's a common question, I think, is people, it's an institution often. They right. Love is some kind of fixed thing, and you're in, in love. Right. It's locked in there, it right? It gets you very confused. What yeah, happens to so. love when you split? Where is where does it go? A metaphysical true. phrase, really. It is. Now, I've, I've used the term love in the documentaries, usually to as a form of communication to get yes. people feel a certain warmth, a reciprocation but towards each other. But you have to understand that every person in society is working for your benefit, not to exploit you or take anything away from you. Mm -hmm. You will be happy to meet any new person yes. in the future yes. because they're all working to make the world a better place. Right. But when a person got, says to you, I got just the house you're looking for, mm -hmm. if they're a salesman, Sure. Or, or they're trying to get you to buy some product of theirs, that's exploitation. When people make money on human misery, such as doctors, if they have a disease and they can't afford to have x-ray treatments or, or solar or MRIs, they can't go to the hospital. So how can a doctor be loyal to his profession if he uses a monetary system? If a person goes to a psychiatrist and says, I'm very troubled, and the guy says, what's your problem? He says, well, I don't earn enough to pay for all the things my family needs. And the guy says, how much do you need to get by? And he writes a check out and gives it to that person. I would say he's a caring psychiatrist. But if he says, that's going to cost you $65 an hour to consult with me, he's not helping that person. So in a monetary system, it's very difficult to be decent, honest, and all of these qualities that you read about that are all artificial. Yes. And one thing I would, I, you mentioned earlier I, that I think is a really good point to reiterate regarding this idea of extensionality is you stated in the past that there's really no such thing as a bad person. In fact, in a lot of ways, people are not, quote, corrupt in and of themselves. They are products of their environment. And usually people judge each other based on how extensional the other person is to them. Yeah. So it becomes a, a relationship thing. So if someone's completely against the Venus Project. It's not that we think they're, quote, bad or wrong or whatever. We don't use that language. They're simply not extensional to they the don't ideas. They see the extension. They don't see the extensionality, right. Yes. I think that's an important uh, social yes. distinction to... I really don't believe there are bad people. I believe that all people brought up in a certain culture or subculture or having different experiences may turn out to become a serial killer a pickpocket, or whatever the conditions that that person is surrounded with. If they're surrounded with general scarcity and cannot get a job, and the only way they can survive is working long hours as a dishwasher for minimum wage, sometimes it's cheaper to pull a bank job. Yeah. You know, as a, as a way out of that dilemma, I would say that everybody, including serious hills, murderers, thieves, liars, are all products of their culture or subculture. There's no such thing as good or bad people. There are people brought up in Nazi Germany as a baby will become Nazis. People brought up in France will speak with a French accent. Brought up in the South, you'll speak with a Southern accent. Not only that, you'll have facial expressions similar to those of your environment. Your environment impinges more upon you than almost anything. So I would say if you know how, to design an environment that outgrows the need for human, aber uh, what we call aberrant behavior. I think that can be educated out of people. We also say that in the way that um, people are perfectly well adjusted for where they're coming from. Hmm. It's really when you're religious, they say, there but for the grace of God goes I. Uh, it, it really means similar things, but they, I don't think that the religious people quite understand that. Otherwise, they'll probably be working on designing a new type of society that brings out more cooperative and productive behavior between people. They try to even teach you that competition is good. It generates incentive. 
It also generates incentive for embezzlement, lying. It does not only create constructive incentive, it also creates destructive incentive. For the most part, it creates yes. destructive incentive. I would, I would say, say by far. By far. It also primes people for the same type of behavior to go to war, to be patriotic and nationalistic. The chain reaction, right. Yeah. Yes. Okay, good. Here's the one. Uh, <clears throat> Jacques and Roxanne, uh, please listen to the following statement and let me know if you agree or not. It's on the carrying capacity of the Earth. Quote, the carrying capacity of the Earth is fixed. However, our ability to realize that capacity is entirely dependent upon our level of scientific knowledge and, more importantly, how that knowledge is applied. Do you agree with this statement? Yes. Good. Would you like to expand on the carrying capacity of the Earth for those that are not familiar? Yes. Uh, if you put uh, 100 people on the moon, the moon doesn't have the capacity. We don't have enough water to support that amount of people. We don't rocket ships that have that power as yet. So I would say that you have to consider the state of technology today and you have to consider what do you have today that you can use to support a certain system. So I would say that an ocean liner can probably put 10,000 people on it, but they can't feed 10,000 people. So you have to ask what the carrying capacity is, is of the ocean liner, and you have to take that amount of passengers. The same with airplanes. You can't load them with thousands of people. They'll never get off the ground. It depends on the wing area and the horsepower. In order to make a de arrive at a decision of any kind, you have to do a survey of the Earth's carrying capacity. And if you find out that the Earth can support three billion people, well, anything excess of that, considerably excess of that, would produce scarcity, which would produce territorial aggression. So you have to think in those terms, not people should be peaceful and shouldn't want to kill one another. You have to eradicate the conditions or outgrow the conditions that produce social arrogance or national arrogance. You had commented when you lived off of uh, when the islands you lived in, I don't yes. remember where they were, in the to Philippines? To Tuamotu, yes. Uh, I'm not sure if this was on those islands, but you said that in, the, in those cultures what they would do if mm. too many people were on the island they would send them off. Find your own island. Right. They get the young people together and say, find your own island. Uh, they knew of dynamic equilibrium in right. nature. You cannot put a thousand people in an area that can only support 500 people. You can do it, right. but if you do it, there'll be starvation, increase in robbery, murders, assassination, and territorial disputes. So you have to design the culture in accordance with the carrying capacity of the earth or the environment. I think a lot of people listening to this that aren't familiar with your work on this subject would conclude, they'd look at the planet and they'd look at society and they would conclude, oh, well, then we must be exceeding the carrying capacity, and that's unproven. We don't know that because our methods are so inefficient, we're wasting so many resources that, first of all, we don't really know the carrying capacity of the earth. I think that's the earth. We can admit that. But what we do know is that the level of uh, efficiency and there's n virtually no conservation, we're wasting everything. So the world we see around us with the starvation is less a product of the carrying capacity of the Earth as we know it, most probably based on the analysis that's been done. We the know we have plenty of energy. What's that? It's the, uh, unintelligent. Absolutely and unintelligent. Manage the Earth's resources. Yes, and what we really need is the intelligent management of the Earth's resources. That can only be done by a systems approach, right. which includes every nation. But if you try to develop one country, like the United States, into a sane environment, if the Chinese do nuclear experiments, it'll contaminate the air all over. If North Korea does that, it'll contaminate the air. We have to invite all nations and find a method of bridging the difference rather than killing. Right. Killing is a supreme failure of nations that don't know how to bridge the difference between nations. And there are many different methods, only you don't hear those people on radio and television. You hear military people, that's managed news. Yeah. We never had a democracy. A lot of people believe we ought to take back our democracy. We've never had it. Right. And the system that we live under today couldn't possibly live within the caring capacity of the Earth, because in order for it to survive, we have to keep producing we have to keep 
making all sorts of products just so people will consume to perpetuate this economic system. And we don't take care of the waste because that's more costly. And our main aim isn't people or maintaining food for people, but the main aim is profit and the bottom line for just a few. Yes. And the sad thing is, as we see the, the slow and likely accelerating collapse of the world as we know it because of resource exploitation, the destruction of resources, the monetary collapse, unfortunately the upper 1% that thrive off of scarcity manipulation mm -hmm. are going to keep going to the bank as this system fails. So if you think that the governments of the world are going to suddenly just wake up one day and realize, the governments, of course, which are basically run by the monetary powers, and they're going to just put a halt to everything, think again. I don't believe there's, any, very, there's very little motivation for the governments. Right. They're going to slowly recompartmentalize, I believe, and they're going to make it more socially acceptable to accept 20% starvation, 25% starvation. They could have done that in the past when most people lived in deprivation, but if people have known abundance, it's very hard like to turn them around like and America, accept like a depression. Yes. In the last depression, a lot of people just barely got by anyway. Mm -hmm. So it was just a little more suffering, yes. especially if they came from foreign countries that had great scarcity. So people, they say, well, what can you do? That's the way it is. But today they know better. They know that the factors of greed, we gave all the money to the banks and the people that created the problem where the public has been shafted. Mm. They took money from education and useful areas of environmental restoration and gave it to the banks. And of course the banks didn't make it available. Sure. They gave it to their own crew. Yes. So you know who runs the show, really. Money yeah. runs the show, very simply. It's, it's sad that people don't seem to understand that. I, I mean to say there are no good countries on Earth yet. There are no civilizations on Earth yet. They are all basically corrupt if they use money. Yes. Now, I want to make one final point on this before we move on to the next question, just because you brought up war. And war is just the most atrocious waste of resources we could probably come yeah. up with. Eventually, we'll probably... And we'll, lives. Yeah, not to mention lives. Yeah. It's almost as though if we keep having wars, we'll exploit and destroy the resources so fast that we won't even have the resources to go to war anymore. Right. And people will be trying to fight each other with sticks and stones. And what's the matter with nuclear war? Oh, sure. It only lasts oh, about three days. You can't make a buck out of that. Yeah. In the past, though, the wars were useful because it brought us out of out of depressions. I, I don't really think they were useful that way, sure, but that's what happened. But but today, with the Iraq war, this is the first war that we've been through where we were still in recession, so that's not even working anymore. Yeah. The mobilization during World War II, which, which actually was, a, was about automation. They brought in tons of automation yeah. as World War II, and then everyone came back, and then they also had ways to get people reemployed. There are programs that were set mm -hmm. up, and these things don't exist anymore. It's a whole no, different yeah. paradigm. Um, okay, let's move on to the next question. This is for you, Jacques. Uh, I understand you used to work a lot with animals and had experiments with animals with conditioning. I was curious about what you had done in this field, animal conditioning, that you had learned. Well, when you I were... worked with uh, dogs a lot and uh, worked with raccoons, and what I've done with them is had them all go up and sit on chairs on a table waiting for food and we can feed them and then the raccoons and including alligators if you take an alligator for example or you make a model of a little child and that child is sitting on a on a ledge near the water kicking its feet the alligator will swim fast jump out of the water and grab one leg of the child or the arm but if you connect it up with a high voltage terminal like a tesla coil and the alligator gets a shock all you have to do is show a child to an alligator as it will swim away from it. Mm -hmm. Instead of saying, drive carefully, highway slippery when wet, put abrasive in the highway, take away the sign, bank the highway so it's not slippery when wet. Sometimes we put up a sign, drive carefully, school children crossing. But if you have a gate where the child presses the button, the light turns red, and the section of the pavement turns up, so no car can hit a kid. That's real caring. Yeah. Putting up a sign, drive carefully, school children crossing, does not assure the elimination of accidents. Accidents are technical negligence, things we left out. 
Jack, you had some interesting experience, experiments that you did even as far back as uh, the Great Depression with animals. Could you describe that a little bit, like the immaculate pig and how you oh, used well, that? Oh, that's a, that's without a visuals it's very difficult. Yeah. Yeah. I condition a pig to keep the environment clean, to change the dirty bed sheet, to take a shower. And I used to run those films at a clan meeting to alter their values regarding animals and people. The people are brought up in a certain environment, certain behaviors are byproducts of that environment. That's patriotism, Judaism, Catholicism, agnosticism. Your environment plays a major role. If you still don't understand me, sometimes you can walk over a person and just listen to them talk and say, are you from Sweden? If you know the dialect. There are people that study language so thoroughly they can tell an Englishman just what part of England or Ireland they came from by the dialect. So not only the dialect, the facial expressions, the mannerisms, and the words they use, all picked up from the environment. So much detail. If you study those things, the book, if you're interested in it, is called The Grammar of Motives, Why People Say What They Say, why they behave as they do. I remember you talking about how you used to train dogs to help the blind. This was, what, some 50 years ago. And also, you, I remember a story you used to talk about how you used to train dogs and a, a woman came up to you, an old lady came yes, up and said... Yes, too. Yeah, yes, she said, what that? a nice dog for leading the blind. And she stroked it on its head, you know. And I'd say to her, I could have trained those dogs to tear soldiers to pieces. The dog is neither good nor bad. Depends on how you raise it. Same with human beings. They are all law-abiding citizens. But the laws they abide are the laws of the society they live in. In other words, they're brought up by certain types of Muslims who believe that Christians are not really but true believers in God, they should be killed. And there are Christians that are brought up to believe that Muslims are, are motivated by the devil, and they should be killed. So if you read the book or get hold of the book, uh, The Travels of Vasco da Gama, the r real book was called uh, uh, Mother Earth, The Face like of Mother India. Yeah. gives you a totally different picture of Vasco da Gama, not what your schools give you. There are many wonderful books that are no longer available. I'm sorry I don't have the time to go into all of that, but there are other ways of thinking about society which you don't get on television. You don't get on soap operas. They're always the same story of who's having an affair with who. People often say that uh, in your society, well not your society, but the society that we advocate that there's a propensity for things to become regimented and people lose their identity. And I think it's important yes. to relay the fact that in this culture today, <clears throat> the illusion of um, identity is Freedom. basically just the crap that people wear in their ornament. Yeah. Almost everyone thinks alike. They watch the same stuff, the yeah. same films come out every year in Hollywood. It's, but, but, they railroad everyone in the same mentality. They, meaning the media establishment, which has probably the absolutely. same values as well. Right. Not only that, but when they make movies on the future, they always show the robot choking the inventor sure. or showing you machines that take over and mistreat people and everything. Star Trek, all the movies on the future have people killing each other in spaceships. They are not about the future. They're some, some jerks concept of the future. We cannot build a sustainable world unless we follow the laws of nature and live in accordance with natural law. Man-made law, most of it, is artificial. Attempt at controlling behavior. We have to live in accordance with natural law. If you don't get enough sleep, nutritious food, you get sick. Man-made law has little or nothing to do with reality. Some jerk wrote uh, a statement like, say no to drugs. That doesn't work at all. I believe it was the president's wife that mm -hmm. said, say no to drugs. How stupid can you be? And individuality isn't the uh, the number of jewelry you put through your nose, your or your cheeks, or your ears, 
or it's not the fashions that you wear. They really pulled one over you to think that you're individual by what they tell you to wear at certain by, times a year, by, yeah, of course. different lengths that are in style. It's really how you think. So there'd be many more individuals in the future because they'll have a broader range of knowledge in so many different fields and able to experience, experiment and come up with new things all the time because they have a deep, deeper understanding of how we relate to the earth and, and how things work. Yes, and I want to add one last thing on this point, and that is um, the fact that for centuries now, information has been controlled. Mm -hmm. Like I think back to your period of time when you were my age, Jacques, and you had maybe one newspaper that came to your door which told you everything that you're supposed to know about the world. Now, of course, we have the Internet, which gives a lot more freedom. Mm -hmm. And in the world that we are advocating, all information would be available to everyone. There's Absolutely. no reason to restrict it. So the individuality of people would, would open up because they have right. so much to choose from and to yes. think about and educate and focus on and gauge their somewhat you know, natural propensities and curiosities. And so. they have access to all sorts of things in education free. Yes. Yes. The Internet today is the greatest liberator mm -hmm. of human values. Absolutely. I, I completely agree. Okay, so here's an interesting question for both of you. Um, how would the Venus Project deal with the military and the police? Uh, if you could talk to the military armed forces and you were able to be candid with them, how would you approach the military? From well, a human I value? would eventually get them to go back to school yeah. to study the history of civilization so they understand the values of different countries. You don't go into another country and say, I'm going to make a democracy here. Mm. You don't come in with armament to make a democracy. You give them extension. You serve. You show them how to increase their agriculture. You make life easier for people. You help them provide for need. And in that way, they're not afraid of other people coming. To Every time one nation visits another nation, they don't go there to enhance the lives of people of another country. They go there either because they have oil, or minerals, or something we want. We are utterly materialistic, so is every other nation. I'm not saying there's any nation that's better than any other, but there's none that are better than any one another. Sure. Where do you think we got this land? We took it by force and violence from New Mexico, from Mexico, Spain, and the American Indians. And we pushed the Indians into the dry reservation areas. Where do you think England got all its territory, or France. They took it by force and violence. So there's no nation that's decent or ethical. After we sold all the land we need, and France and England, then they put up the sign, thou shalt not steal. You understand? There's no other way nations become large, except through violence and war. And when we won the war, we kidnapped the German technicians, took their rocket ships, we stole their advanced technology. Yeah. And if organization and, and if society gets organized in the future in such a way as we're talking about the Venus Project, and we share resources, then there's really no reason for military to protect their resources. And there's really when when you have access to goods and services within the society, there's no need for police. And when you have good transportation systems. So you don't need to tell people not to speed. That's just like saying, say no to drugs. Then you wouldn't need police on the highways giving out tickets. We want to reorganize society where we bypass the need for such laws and we, we eliminate. For example, we could even design automobiles with proximity units so they can't hit one another. That's what you really want. You don't want a law they right. drive safely. You want to design automobiles so they can't hit one another. We surpass the need for laws and police and, and the military. Right. And when, you, when you put a person in jail, that doesn't turn them, they don't turn out any better. If a person steals three loaves of bread from a supermarket for whatever reasons, and you give them three months in jail, that doesn't cause, eliminate the problem of theft. That merely suspends it. So if you make the necessities of life available to people, they don't steal. There's no need for prisons or police. Police are a byproduct of a distorted or warped culture. Yes, yes.
And while they think they're doing something noble, oh, yes. that's for sure. They all and believe that. that. Yes. Uh, I think I'm there's nothing against policemen. I'm just telling it. They, too, are victims of an aberrant society. Right. I've been, I've been condemned for some phrase I mentioned where I, I commented on the military, stating that they were, quote, brainwashed assassins which they felt was a bit harsh. That's they all were, soldiers. They were, uh, absolutely. Yeah, killing I, machines. While, while, that is, while that might not be polite to yeah. state, to very, the very concept of going into the military is obviously with the pretense of invading another country and going into combat and essentially killing people. That's right. That's so there's no nobility or educational at The Army is an educational institution. Yeah. I mean, granted, people can learn certain things that are technical, but anyway, I just want to point that the out. The Army's notions of defense is building weapons. Whenever you build a weapon, some other nation that can't build a weapon will hijack an airplane and use it as a weapon. There is no security. At all your airports, you have detection devices, and yet people are able to smuggle things in. It's very easy to design clothing that give off a noxious gas that will kill people that can't be detected by x-ray. Whatever man thinks of, some other nation could think of another way around that. The only security is bridging the difference between mm-hmm. nations and making resources available to everyone so they all have a piece of the pie. And that's what it's about. The nations that fight back, that hate each other, just want another, just want a piece of the pie. And that's all it's about. And if you conquer other nations, rob them of their resources, take things away, destroy their environment, you're producing forces that are adverse to our way of life. So you will always have war and hatred if the system continues. Mm -hmm. It's self-eliminating. We're working toward eliminating the well-being of all people on Earth. Okay, here's one on the uh, the central database computer that we talk about, where people in the future will interact with a system of knowledge to arrive at conclusions better. The question is, Jacques, can you elaborate on how we will interact with the central database computer and how it will be used as a decision-making tool and not for controlling an individual's life? Oh, the control of an individual's life, meaning that the individual is aberrated. But we see no conditions in the future that would aberrate human behavior. Somebody said to me, would people be alike in the future since your city's around and your education is similar? Yes, they will. They will be alike in certain areas. They will not want to kill or hurt one another. Or they will never be racist or bigots because that's cleaned out in the upbringing of people. And if you raise children in the schools of the future, they'll be raised together. Japanese, Afro-American, all children brought up together. Children have no bias, hatred, or racial prejudice. It's when the mother says, you're a Lutheran, you don't play with that little Catholic boy or Catholic girl, or you're Jewish and you marry a nice Jewish girl. You don't marry a Gentile. It's parents that are brought up with these aberrations that separate society, that make it difficult to bridge the difference. True. As far as the central database computer, as far as interacting with uh, the system that we've talked about... Well, a computer, for example, a pilot, really has to use his own judgment in many instances. But when instruments were developed for aircraft, such as a little ball put in a semi-circular glass tube, when the ball is on center, it means the plane was level. When he heads for a certain compass heading, which no human can do, we go by the compass. We assign direction to compass. We assign the height, not a pilot looking out of the airplane saying, I'm a mile and a half high. We use Doppler radar because it's more sensitive than the human and tell us exactly how high we are. No human can do that. That's why it's not a machine takeover. What it is is that machines in some areas are more sensitive than human beings. They will be assigned the task of giving the elevation that the airplane is above the Earth. That's how we tell the distance of planets. We have beams that we can send out to the moon and get feedback from it and get the distance exactly that way. We have, uh, we have detecting devices made to comprise of prisons and light, light analytical methods. And these tell us whether there's oxygen on other planets and what kind of material exists on other, other planets. No human 
loving human beings, how do they know that the moon has no oxygen? They have devices, which looks like a prison, and they get a color band from that, and that color band tells them what that planet lacks. So, what? so we make instruments as extensions of human attributes. The microscope shows us a world that we can't see, and the electron microscope brings us to a level that we can't sense at all. There are germs on the table. If you didn't have a microscope, you'd never know that. Remember that a microscope is an extension of human need. So machines were looked upon as extensions to human attributes, not as a threat to life. They're looked upon as a threat because when a new machine comes in the factory, the boss doesn't call the help and say, now you work four hours a day instead of eight hours, and now you have a, a one month vacation rather than two weeks. Right. It's cheaper to get rid of you and call it downsizing. That's why I try to tell people continuously that they don't give a damn about you, otherwise they wouldn't outsource to other countries. If they cared about the American people, they would employ you, but they outsource because they can't stay in business if they don't meet the competition of other nations. You live in a competitive society, that means they can't afford to be decent and shorten the workday, increase your purchasing power, increase your vacation time. But in a global society, free of money, that has free access to resources, no more will you hear how much does it cost to build that city, how much does it cost to build the bridge. Do we have the resources to do that? Yes, we do. We have more than enough resources to house everyone and make all the necessities of life available to all people. Not how much will it cost. Do we have the resources? Very good. You want to add to that, Roxanne? Yeah, today uh, different companies and industries have databases based on whatever their particular need is for their corporation. But in the future, in the holistic system within the resource-based economy, there'd be central databases of all information. And this way, when we know what's happening in different parts of the world, anywhere in the world, all aspects, if you want to ship so many automobiles or so many pieces of house, you know, for housing to another country, you would know if there's a flood or if the roads are down. You would have that information at your fingertips. And today, with all our knowledge and all our technology, groups of people or individual groups of people, no matter how much they were trained, could not manage all that information. So we would need that for a holistic approach for designing society and maintaining society. And that way, they would be able to make more appropriate decisions when needed. We need computers in government to give us that information. Computers have to be connected to all industry, transportation systems, human illness, so we know how many hospitals to build. We know how much medication to prepare. No human can do that. Right. Machines could handle a thousand trillion bits of information per second. Mm -hmm. No humans can do that. It is not a machine takeover that I'm talking about. I'm talking about using machines wherever it would be advantageous to human life. Today, people are, are afraid of machines, and rightfully so, within the, the monetary system when the bottom line is profit, because machines today are, are used to kill people better and quicker and more efficiently, or when machines take over in, the, in an industry, then people are laid off of work and they don't care about you, as Jacques said. But in a resource-based economy, machines would be your friends, really. They'd be used to make your life better and easier and with the access to more resources. I'd like to, to summarize this question, if I may. There's two things I often bring up when people bring up this central database. And by the way, programs like this already do exist in fragments. They just are not expanded to encompass other fields. Algorithms will be developed to make cross-referencing yes, a, a reality. But the first thing I say is, A, no human being can operate without bias. We can't yeah. operate in an utterly objective manner. Only machines can do so. And B, no human being can possibly understand all the variables that need to be taken into account for basically any problem. Right. It's, not, it's simply impossible and against our wiring. So it's a, people say this is what it sounds like science fiction when we bring up this idea. Um, and you, you have an example of it, a very good one, in Looking Forward, which I think other people should read. You can download that from the venusproject.com in PDF form for free. 
um, we need a tool that can, that can objectively analyze all the variables as we know it today and then encapsulate them. And then we use that to inform us, not to that control would give us. give us closer approximations yes. of reality. Right. Nothing is final. There are no final frontiers. Absolutely. Um, one quick technical question, Jacques, and if you don't know it, don't worry about it, but what are your thoughts on thermal depolymerization? Do you know what thermal depolymerization is? Polymerization? Yeah, they're chains of molecules. Chains of molecules? And uh, what, what do they want to know about it? They said, what are some good counterclaims to this conversion process? Unfortunately, their context is a bit abstract. If you're not... I don't know how they mean to okay. use that. Okay, that's no problem. I really can't answer That's no problem. Um, let's see here. We have we have about two minutes left. This is going very, very fast. Um, okay, Jacques, Roxanne, could you please explain how the Venus Project arrived at the idea that a test city would be the most efficient way to begin transition from our current economy to a resource-based economy? Well, the first city that would be built would be a research center to gather information as to how many factories we have, how much transportation is available, how much arable land, what the physical condition of people are over the world, what percentage of people are sick. So we have a frame of reference for designing the parameters of the future. So the first city will be a statistical data gathering system right. to so that we can better in the future. Right. The um, one thing I'll add is that really this this person is assuming I think, and I apologize if if they're listening, and but that uh, this that the city is a transition point for the move. But it really, while that's important, it's it not as important. the workability. It's not as of important. The Venus Project's proposal. Yes, exactly. Just and as we modify should have it as necessary. Right. But the real transition aspect is the social therapy, as you yes. call it. Yeah. Yeah, the need for a, a highly changing expansive the way to think. Absolutely. Absolutely. Or the way they've been taught to think about things. Right, precisely. In fact, though, we have one minute left. Uh, if there's anything you want to say to comment on the need for education and the need for people to get out there and educate each other, any words of wisdom you might want to add for those that want to try and help? Yeah, those of you that really want to help the Venus Project, if you do nothing, if you don't talk to your church group or club members about the Venus Project, I can assure you nothing will happen. It's only if you act, become active and try to bring this about. It's not a perfect system. It's just a lot better. And if you have anything you can add to the Venus Project to, to make it more feasible or acceptable, we welcome your participation. Very good. We have 10 seconds left. Thank you very much for listening, everybody, and I hope everyone's doing well. And make sure you get something together for Z-Day, and we'll see you next uh, Well, You'll be hearing us talk next week at the same time. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>